According to the Innocence Project, an advocacy group that provides legal aid to the wrongfully convicted, the average DNA exoneree served 13 years in prison before he or she was freed. 17 have been sentenced to death. 67% of the exonerated were convicted after 2000, the year that marked the onset of modern DNA testing. Each new exoneration adds more urgency to the question that has hovered over these cases since the first convict was cleared by DNA back in 1989. How many more innocent people are waiting to be freed? As the pace of DNA exonerations has grown across the country in recent years, wrongful convictions have revealed disturbing trends in our criminal justice system. In each case where DNA has proven innocence beyond doubt, an overlapping array of causes has emerged, from mistakes to misconduct to factors of race and class. Those exonerated by DNA testing aren't the only people who've been wrongfully convicted in recent decades. For every case that involves DNA, there are hundreds that do not. Only a fraction of criminal cases involve biological evidence that can be subjected to DNA testing. And even when such evidence exists, it is often lost or destroyed after a conviction. Since they don't have access to a definitive test like DNA, many wrongfully convicted people have a slim chance of ever proving their innocence. Glenn Garber has been practicing law for over 20 years. He's an accomplished federal and state court trial appellate lawyer with a focus on criminal defense and post-conviction exonerations. I wanted to meet up with Glenn to talk more about DNA exonerations and the challenges the wrongfully convicted face when there's a lack of DNA evidence. Well, once somebody's convicted um, in a court of law, and I can speak for the United States, okay, there's a tremendous resistance um, in undoing those convictions. And, and I'm talking pri primarily about violent crimes, homicides, where people are spending lengthy periods of time in jail, no one wants to reopen those wounds. And prosecutors don't want to admit they made mistakes because it erodes public confidence. Um, so you have to realize if you're litigating a case post-conviction um, and you don't have DNA, which can be ironclad proof in these cases, you're faced with a lot of resistance and the litigation gets complicated, protracted, um, and it has to be you know, very, very good evidence that is essentially irrefutable. Um, and if it's not DNA, you're probably talking about multiple witnesses, you're probably talking about forensic evidence that hadn't been analyzed properly, um, and it's not easy. But DNA tends to sort of circumvent that litigation and say, look, we have this, you know, if it's a critical piece of evidence in the case and points to another, another perpetrator, um, it's not faced with as much resistance. Garber is also the founder of the exoneration initiative known as EXI, an organization that provides free legal assistance to wrongfully convicted persons in New York. They focus on the most challenging cases, those that lack DNA evidence. The initiative comes at a time when courts are becoming receptive to non-DNA cases. Confronted with the reality that intolerable number of innocent people are languishing in jail, courts are now considering the merits of innocence claims, looking beyond overly formalistic barriers which have prevented review for decades. The Exoneration Initiative is a program that I started about five years ago that focuses on non-DNA innocence cases in New York. And we um, took over the case out of the Second Look program, which was run out of Brooklyn Law School. And it was run by Professor William Hellerstein, who's now on our board of directors. And we did it because we felt that there was a need for people to focus on, lawyers to focus on non-DNA cases. The Innocence Project is in New York, and they handle DNA cases, but there's a huge gap here. Um, and we believe that most of the wrongful convictions are in non-DNA cases because DNA only exists in about 10% of criminal prosecutions. And the same failures that happen in the non-DNA, in the DNA cases also happen in the non-DNA cases. So we look for, um, and we're very selective, for the non-DNA cases that we could help out on. And we believe it's the lion's share of the wrongful convictions. 
So the work is very time consuming, very, very um, detail oriented, and it could take years to cultivate a case through investigation and then the litigation um, can be protracted because you can bring a very, very compelling case, but you're sometimes before the same judge who was the trial judge who's hostile to you. Um, and it may not be until appeal or thereafter that you're going to get relief and go back down again. And these cases can take many, many years. They're huge endeavors. Um, and obviously we need more funding for our work. He continues by telling me that most wrongful convictions resulted from a combination of errors. Eyewitness misidentification is the single greatest cause of wrongful convictions nationwide, playing a role in nearly 75% of convictions overturned through DNA testing. Talking about eyewitness identification, okay, if you look at the DNA exonerations, 75% um, of the DNA exonerations came, the evidence of guilt was eyewitness identification. So it's a huge cause of wrongful convictions. This is misidentifications. And I have been a criminal defense attorney for 23 years and I know how fallible eyewitness identification can be. The problem is, and this is theatrics of a courtroom, when a witness points to the defendant and says, that's the guy who did it, even if they didn't get a good opportunity to, to see him or her, um, or there's a delay between the crime and the identification, jurors are more swayed by that pointing in the courtroom in that dra dramatic moment, that's the guy. And it's very difficult to overcome, even though it's very weak evidence. My next stop was to meet with two students from Pace University. I wanted to get their opinion about our topic of discussion today and to see what they thought were the main challenges exonerees face upon re-entry in society. For the most part, it, you know, once you come out and you can't, you can't you know, get a job or you're stuck on welfare, I mean, it's probably, it's probably like a repetitive process where you can't get out of. You have, you have people that have been imprisoned for short amount of times, a medium to one year kind of time, you know, we're talking about days, months, year, maybe one year to two years, short sentences. And then you have uh, these, these, this other group with a, that have been locked up for lifetimes, really, you know? According to psychologists, exonerees' attempts to reconcile their incarceration with their innocence can lead to suffering that is impossible to make sense of, suffering that becomes very difficult to build from or grow out of. Exonerees often struggle with dating and intimate relations after their release, with trust and expressing their rage and despair being particularly challenging and causing them to engage in avoidance or distancing behaviors. They face difficulties maintaining marriages and reuniting with children who also suffered imprisonment. Exonerees are not entitled to housing assistance, employment, financial aid, or health care. In addition to leaving prison with little help or nowhere to go, only a fraction of exonerees receive compensation for wrongful conviction or have their innocence fully acknowledged by prosecutors, investigators, or even victims. So should the government compensate the wrongfully convicted? I think that uh, you know it's their responsibility to help these people get back on their feet. You know, especially since they'll, they'll to society they'll uh, be looked as uh, down upon as um, you know convicted fe uh, felons or you know for whatever crime. So it's definitely their responsibility to help them get on their feet, help them financially. You'd think that they would have something like a basis, a plan set out in front of, for these guys to kind of to. Um, just adjust and, and just work back into the mesh of just community, you know? But it's tough because the public's going to have this outlook on these guys no matter what, you know? Because they've been locked up for the... No matter, no matter what happened, whatever the, whatever the process was on getting out, the public is always going to see these guys as these guys that are in prison for... I'm not talking about everybody, but you're going to have a general kind of... Um, public outlook, which is sad, it's the truth though. Professor Janae S. Nelson joined St. John's University School of Law in 2006. She's an associate professor of law and the associate director of the Ronald H. Brown Center for Civil Rights and Economic Development. In the years before she joined St. John's, Nelson was a Fulbright Scholar at the Legal Resources Center in Accra, Ghana, where she researched the political disenfranchisement of persons with criminal convictions and what it portend for the advancement of democracy in Ghana. I sat down with Janae Nelson to talk more about reentry programs and the existing legislation on compensation after reentry. That's right. I think anyone who has 
been incarcerated and who's coming out to re-enter society is going to have a difficult time for a number of reasons. But I think people who've been exonerated, who've been in prison wrongfully, have an, an even harder cross to bear, so to speak. Uh, they have to contend with the psychological damage of having been betrayed by a criminal justice system that is supposed to uh, find out the truth and weed out error and not convict innocent people. So I think that while it's difficult for anyone trying to reenter society from prison, certainly those who know that they should have never been there in the first place have a more difficult time adjusting and accepting uh, and, and moving beyond that circumstance. To make matters worse, exonerees are saddled with the responsibility of continually having to explain their exonerated status to prospective employers, landlords, and others who identify them as ex-cons. I think we have to be careful not to create a climate of fear around people who've been in prison. Uh, the ideal goal would be to rehabilitate these persons, um, whether they're, they're, they were presumed to have been guilty. So while they were in prison, they should have been uh, educated, they should be rehabilitated. That's the ideal circumstance. As we know, our prison system doesn't really do that effectively. Um, but I don't think that we should presume that there will be any recidivism if this is someone who had not committed a crime in the first place. While I'm sure they've been exposed to a great deal of violence and behavior that would not be acceptable in society generally while they were in prison, I do think that they, with the right resources, will stand a good chance of reintegrating. The problem is that we don't provide those resources to most people who come out of prison generally and even to those who were in prison wrongfully. Seeing that the judicial system is still playing catch up with wrongfully convicted cases via DNA testing, I asked Professor Nelson if the legal system should start focusing their attention on setting up an official program for just those exonerated. I do think a program that is dedicated to this population is absolutely needed. Uh, what we've seen is the Innocent Project, other the Innocence Project, and other organizations, Life After Exoneration. Um, there have been a number of not-for-profits that have come up to try to service this population. And while it's not a tremendously large pool, uh, we don't really know the extent of the error, right? It only uh, surfaces when we have a prisoner who has the resources to get DNA testing to challenge their conviction in this very complex way. Uh, that's when we discover the error. There are a number of people who are in prison who are claiming innocence who don't have access to these resources. So I don't think we really understand the extent of the problem uh, and we don't know how many innocents might be imprisoned and that population certainly deserves some dedicated services and the government ought to provide that uh, and fill that void that currently not-for-profits are doing. The federal government, the District of Columbia, and 27 states have compensation statutes of some form. Texas, for example, has one of the highest levels of compensation for the wrongfully convicted, with options that include jobs and vocational training. 23 other states do not, like Arizona, Colorado, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Washington, to name a few. Many exonerees were wrongfully convicted in their youth, while their peers were advancing their careers or getting an education. After a decade or more in prison, exonerees find themselves starting over at an older age. Absolutely, I don't think any monetary compensation can fully make someone whole uh, from that sort of tragic circumstance, but certainly providing them with financial resources would go a great long way to their recovery and to their rehabilitation and more importantly to their reintegration in society. Uh, there aren't many aspects of Texas's criminal justice system that I would follow or recommend following, but I think this is one area where uh, they are doing something very useful and helpful to help uh, the exonerated and help them reintegrate. But having monetary compensation is important, not just for the individual, but also exact some sort of penalty on the system itself, which is very useful to help deter the sort of conduct that led to the wrongful convictions in the first place. There, there must be a comprehensive reintegration program that includes not just financial resources, you can't just throw money at this problem, you have to throw human resources and really bring this individual back into society with all the necessary support. And what is important to consider is it's not just this one individual going at this alone. Many times individuals are trying to reconnect with family, perhaps children that they've left when they've been incarcerated. Uh, they're trying to get their financial independence, but also their emotional independence. 
uh, being out in society without the regimented schedule that they've been subjected to for on average, which is over a dozen years for the average exonerated person, uh, there's a great deal of support in terms of employment, housing, uh, family psychological services, and other means that we can, a more holistic approach that we can uh, use to help these individuals. Mm -hmm.